Welcome to the Intuality AI podcast, where we give predictions and discuss the implications of those predictions and the things that are going on in the world. And of course, we've been spending a lot of time talking about COVID-19. This is the second in our series about how to open up the economy. Uh, previously, we had Dr. David Katz talking about that from the preventive health uh, uh, position. Today, I'm delighted to be uh, with Grant Rainier, the founder and chairman of Intuality AI, uh, and also Will Rassman. Will is a certified financial planner. Uh, he started working on Wall Street. He is the founding principal of Prosper Point, a wealth management company based in the LA area. He's also author of a book called Atlas Shift, Mastering Your Financial Experience in the Post-Information Age. And he's also written for many well-known and reputable financial uh, magazines and, and papers. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, gentlemen. Good. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. And, and Grant, Good to see you too. Uh, Thank you. And again, we're going to talk about opening up the economy and, and trying to weigh the various risks uh, and advantages and the different aspects of it. Um, one of the things that I think has maybe perplexed a few people, and, and perhaps Will, you can answer this question or, or be the first to answer it, is the economy looks like it's in a huge, huge mess. Uh, the future is uncertain. And yet, for the most part, the, the stock market has, you know, the Dow and the S&P have by and large sort of, they've dropped a little bit, but nothing in comparison to some of the sort of worst predictions that people are making. Now, why why is that do you think well i believe that i'm not alone in uh, the the opinion that these the government stimulus you know the now 2 trillion uh dollars and and growing is propping up uh the markets you know the domestic markets as well as the international you know we're we're not the only ones here that are um, pumping liquidity into the economy. And so, um, you know, the, the outlook here is that the economy is going to show six to seven months of contraction um, spread out over three quarters. And I think that, uh, you know, the fiscal and monetary actions by Washington um, are going to be weighted as a positive effect um, in softening the economic blow and the bulls on Wall Street have um, have really taken advantage of that and uh, you know and, and I think that they're pricing in additional spending and um, you know we'll see how that all comes to be but you know we did this you know this isn't our first rodeo we did this back in 2008 and um and so you know to the extent that that injecting liquidity is going to help you know in a medium to long term uh is, i think is is the question of course it's helping in the near term but um what does it mean for you know all sorts of other areas of life just not economic Right. So the stimulus has this effect of sort of holding things up for the time being and deferring what may be a bad scenario, at least for a little bit. And hopefully in that time, things will recover and bounce back and we won't have a pre precipitous fall in the economy. I guess that's the hope, right? Right. In, in that, yeah, that, that we've uh, taken, you know, enough of, of a measure to, um, you know, ward off, you know, a depression 
um, of sorts. You know, I don't think that anybody would would argue that you know we've we've currently went into recessionary times. Um, but I think we one of the things to to remember on this is that recessions usually are uh, brought about by um, bubbles of of some sort, right? It's, it's um, you know, whether it's, you know, the tech bubble or, um, you know, our mortgage-backed securities or, or, you know, anything else that kind of bubbles up. This particular, and, and the reason that this is, you know, I think so um, kind of unknown and, and really, you know, just kind of crazy to people to wrap their minds around is that this, the cause of this recession is different. And, um, and, you know, it, it's a, for lack of a better term, it's a man-made recession. Right. That's, it's not inherent in the economy. It's just something that's been imposed on it. Right. Exactly. And hmm. so when, when you, have a reaction to a man-made recession, which is uh, doing more man-made things to the economy. I believe that there's going to be unintended consequences to that. Like it, to, to put the $2 trillion stimulus package in perspective, that amount is double the size of the bill that Congress passed in 2008 to fight the last recession. Right. It's equal to all bills that passed in both 2008 and 2009. I mean, it's huge. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, again, what are the possible downsides to, to all the spending? I mean, that, that's a serious question. Yeah, I, think, <clears throat> I think Will's made some good points here and that this, this downturn is certainly totally different than... Uh, what we've had in the past, recent past, that have been generated by uh, financial bubbles and uh, monetary uh, uh, things that have gone on that uh, have been uh, indigenous in a an economy that grows and has periodic bubbles. Uh, this is certainly quite different. Uh, I think that as a result, I look at it differently. Uh, I think uh, from everything that uh, I look at, uh, that the recovery um, can be much faster than what I think uh, we're, we're estimating it to be. We're estimating the recovery to be similar to other recoveries as they have been in the past, and that's all fine and good. But I think there's a, uh, uh, certainly a lot of excess capital that is sitting in bank accounts unspent that with uh, a very little bit of urging and a very critical tipping point uh, that uh, uh, that uh, those funds can become uh, liquid and uh, get in circulation very quickly. Uh, certainly I think with the, it's my opinion that the market at this point, uh, the stock market for example, and the indices have are indicating that the uh, the market has reached a bottom. Uh, I don't believe it's going to go much further. Uh, there might be a spike down once in a great while, but I think it's reached a bottom. It is being supported by, uh, first of all, um, a basic valuation of the economy uh, that is um, being indirectly recognized by human behavior that's driving uh, the, the bulls in the market to uh, uh, to come into it periodically here. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, so, so I think that uh, the, the, rec the recovery could surprise us. It could be much faster than uh, what uh, we thought. Uh, as you know, just uh, today, there's been a follow-up announcement from uh, one of the companies that is doing um, research uh, for a um, inoculation for, vir for uh, the coronavirus and um, the trials they've taken, that they've they've made and reported on, seem to be very positive, and they're indicating that uh, something could be available by the end of the year, which is uh, 
you know, certainly a little faster than what I think everybody anticipated. And what's interesting is how the, uh, the markets and the financial media and others are reacting to this information uh, very quickly uh, and rather positively. Now, I don't know if that's gonna last. That'll probably go up and down, but uh, it's my feeling, my gut feeling that uh, uh, as we go along here, uh, we have a great uh, propensity for this uh, whole economy to come back very quickly. On the other hand, I know that we wanna talk about um, what portions of the economy have been permanently changed. Uh, the workforce, um, uh, work environments and so forth. And that's, uh, there's gonna be a portion of it that is permanently changed, I think, that will come back, but in a different form. What do you think, Will? Do you think it's possible this recovery could be quicker than most people are forecasting? Or do you see it inevitably dragging out? I mean, I, and this is, you know, kind of one of the fun things about doing these things, but I have a completely different opinion on it. And, um, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're probably, uh, you know, going to see some sort of shades of gray. I mean, one of the things that I've said in um, previous talks that I've been giving lately is the, the folks that believe that this is, you know, that have ap apocalyptic assumptions are going to be just as wrong as the people that believe that we're going to come out of this unscathed. Um, you know, the world works in, in shades of gray. I think that, um, that, I mean, my, my professional opinion is that uh, we, we have yet to, to even try and, and, and figure out how much damage this has done to the economy from a structural level. Um, and, uh, you know, as we all know, or, or as we, at least we, we have a pretty good hunch on that the market of today, especially a volatile uh, one that has been, you know, kind of shocked by, uh, you know, a huge macroeconomic event um, is, is uh, acting upon speculation. And so, um, you know, the, I mean, we are just, if you, if you look at the, one of the things that, that the indicators that I like to look at is the cyclically, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. It's a, um, a Robert Schiller uh, uh, indicator that you can look up. Um, he's a professor at Yale. Uh, uh, if anybody sort of the case Schiller um, home prices index, he's one of the guys that started that too. So the cyclically adjusted price to earnings index uh, shows that, you know, we are still um, pretty darn expensively valued, um, even with the, the correction in so every recession. Um, and, and he has the data going back to, uh, the late 1800s, every recession ended with a cape of less than 10. The only one that didn't was 2008. And what does that mean to the uninitiated viewer? A cape it, less it means than 10. to a cape. So a cape less than 10. So basically a cape or a, or a P ratio. One way to think about it is as an investor, you're buying a, a stock, you're buying into a company, um, prepaying for the next X number of years of earnings. So if something has a PE of 10, or some, so yeah, something has a PE of 10, you are prepaying for the next 10 years of earnings. That's what a PE ratio, I mean, that's one way that you can think about a PE ratio. I think that's a good way to think about it. So um, at the, the height of, you know, kind of before COVID, we were at a 33 meaning that people were willing to pay for the next 33 years of earnings. That's crazy, in my opinion. That's absolutely nuts. And so uh, the long-term uh, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio is about 15. That's the long-term average. Um, most people say that, you know, PEs of around 15 are 
you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a fair value. Um, you know, even after this little bit of a correction, we're still in the mid to high 20s. I think that we eventually have to, to let the market correct itself in the way that it wants, the way that it needs to complete the cycle. And that would mean that the, that the cape goes below 10. And if that means going below 10 from now, then I believe we see a 40 to 60% decline um, sometime in the near-ish future. Brent, have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, uh, and it's good, as Will says, to have some uh, differing opinions here. The, uh, I think that uh, uh, one thing that's important to remember here is that uh, as we started out, uh, the, the situation that we're in has been caused by a virus that uh, has had a, an effect, a sociological effect, a medical effect, infrastructure effect uh, that has uh, uh, not been duplicated probably in, uh, back in all the way to 1918 uh, during that pandemic, and the data on uh, the detail at which we have it now just isn't available as to how that whole thing proceeded. But the, uh, it's good to separate them, I think. Um, the kinds of things that Will's are ta Will is talking about are, are subjects that, that uh, need debate, and need discussion, and I would agree with them on some. The, uh, on the other hand, we have a situation here that's been caused by something quite different. Um, and uh, that's why I think that uh, uh, through some uh, solution to this, through a vaccine uh, that is on the horizon someplace, um, can solve some of the, uh, uh, the financial and economic uh, effects of the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, but that sort of rides on the side of the overall uh, progression of the economy uh, through this period, especially since 2008. And there've been two, th two, in my mind, two basic things that have made the recovery since 2008 uh, and the various uh, characteristics of it different. And one is the Fed has certainly conducted itself quite differently since then uh, through new policy and new ways of looking at uh, unemployment and inflation and, and uh, uh, price inflation and how they've conducted that has been quite different than it ever has in the past. And so it makes it difficult to, you know, it's sometimes to compare that to prior to 2008. The other is uh, the, what I would call an explosion of growth in new technologies and these, this isn't uh, the far out technology, this is in certainly uh, in social media, in internet, uh, in all of the devices and so forth that uh, are coming out of all of that is, and in fact, the one that we're enjoying right now, the fact that we can conduct uh, this meeting over Zoom, all of a sudden, you know, we're not the only ones doing this. And I'm not so sure that uh, when this is all said and done, uh, that uh, this technology uh, is going to simply go back to its, its usage level that was prior to the pandemic. I think it's going to stay. And I think it's going to make some permanent changes in how we conduct business. Certainly, you can make a good argument for the economics of conducting business this way. Um, even if somebody decides to work at home uh, full-time or part-time uh, with the uh, agreement of their, of their employer, uh, and they happen to be in a sector of, of business where they can do that, uh, you can't argue about the economic benefits of doing that. Simply driving time, uh, commuting time, uh, changing locations. Uh, you know, there's a lot of permanent change that this might just uh, uh, make uh, a, uh, a substantial use of technologies that have been there for some time now. Uh, that uh, just needed sort of a kick to get uh, uh, their greater usage to take place. So I, th I think that technology change and the conduct of the Fed 
since 2008, I think are creating a different world for us. Do you, uh, well, well, what do you think uh, will be the changes, the more permanent changes that will come to the conducting of business and the economic sector as a result of this? I mean, obviously, uh, perhaps more virtual meetings and, and more people working from home, perhaps is an obvious one. I assume you see that happening. What other things can you anticipate, albeit recognizing that's just a guess, but it's an interesting um, game to play to think about what are the consequences of going through this? So I would be, if I find it, you know, kind of, uh, interesting that I'm taking maybe a little bit more uh, traditional um, approach than uh, the other two gentlemen on here, which are a little bit older than me. But the, I think that one of the things that we need to, to ask ourselves is how quickly do we, do we think that people will allow things to change? I mean, it wasn't that long ago where, you know, the majority of us were working in factories. I mean, that was, I mean, that was just a moment ago, if, if you look at it, you know, in, in the greater scheme of, of history. Um, it was just a moment ago that, you know, women entered the workforce. I mean, it, if, we, if we look at what has happened, you know, over the past 10 years or so, I mean, the rate of change is just unbelievable. And people... I believe um, are you know, are resistant to to rapid changes. Um, you know, it's since since the nineteen seventies since we've we've outsourced a good portion of our uh, of our manual labor sector um, that that hasn't come without cost to both sides of of the spectrum. And so I would, I would be cautious as to how quickly we believe that, that, um, that your average worker can pivot on this. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not convinced as of right now that, uh, you know, your average Joe in middle America can go from working in in office building or a factory or wherever he works to now sitting down and working from home. I'm just not convinced, convinced that he can do that. Maybe I'm too pessimistic about it. Maybe, um, you know, maybe I'm not, I'm not giving him enough credit, but at the end of the day, I've seen, I mean, I've, I've taken into account, I've, I've done a pretty good inventory on the changes that have happened to your, your average worker over the past 30 years or so. And, and they don't, you know, they don't happen seamlessly. It happens with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of kicking and screaming. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I've, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously, um, I'm cautiously pessimistic about all of this. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with Will. Uh, the, um, you don't get an argument with me there. Uh, one strange thing here is that uh, uh, considering our age differences, I should really be the more conservative and you should be the more <laughs> the other side of it, uh, yep. more optimistic, but uh, nevertheless. I, I think that even before this uh, virus took place and had its effect on the uh, economy and people's lives and people's uh, work. Uh, there's been a very strong, even exponential change going on. And that is that, um, uh, and I talk about it as being uh, the shelf life of technology. Uh, the shelf life, that is, you invent something, you, you you, you produce it, you scale it, and you get it out into the marketplace. And uh, it uh, hopefully, you know, experiences the, the hockey stick kind of growth. But at some point, um, other, comp other competitors come in. 
or uh, at the same time, you found a better solution to your original product and the shelf life of that product uh, you know, quickly dies. And that shelf life, as I see it, uh, has been uh, compressing very rapidly, not even just linearly, but uh, exponentially. Uh, I think it's affected uh, certainly uh, the, uh, the venture capital um, segments of our, of our, of our world. Uh, the demands uh, that they uh, are making for um, uh, justifying investment in, in new firms or in existing firms uh, has been uh, compressing, more difficult to, uh, to satisfy. And all of that, I think, is, uh, can be traced back to either their conscious or, or unconscious uh, uh, realization that uh, the technologies that, they're, that they want to pursue uh, have a relatively short uh, uh, shelf life. And so uh, what happens, I think, uh, for example, I would pick uh, a shelf life of a new technology uh, in lots of things we can think about as being three to four years. So if you do the math uh, and work back to the beginning of a new product, uh, the, the economics to be able to bring that to market and scale it and earn a reasonable return uh, is getting more challenging. On the other hand, uh, that challenge is being met sometimes very well by the supporting technologies around it. Uh, the, for example, uh, we're supposedly migrating to uh, uh, the uh, fifth generation of, uh, of um, cell phone systems. And uh, that in itself is not a product but that is a supporting technology that will hopefully, you know, cause many different kinds of new product, new uh, end user products uh, coming out of it, making use of it. And that's going very fast. So I think that uh, the, uh, the point here I'll make without talking much more at this point is uh, that uh, uh, we're in a new world since 2008. Uh, we, uh, the people who are uh, being affected and probably substantially are the ones that require uh, certain on the job at the at the point of work for at the point where the the work is being done uh, somewhat manual labor uh, that don't have the luxury of being able to uh, easily work from home that's understood uh, on the other hand one of the things that's been going on since the last 20 years of my observation anyway is that uh, the concept of a, uh, a person, either a high school graduate or a college graduate, uh, expecting to go to work for a corporation and staying with that corporation and working throughout his entire career and, and uh, retiring from that corporation, I don't think that that's, uh, a, that's not the way the world is working anymore. Uh, that's one of the things that's pushing the independence of healthcare, uh, healthcare systems and healthcare uh, insurance systems away from corporations. The same thing with independent uh, management of one's retirement. Um, those are all good things, but they are being much more, there, there's considerable pressure politically and economically to separate those from corporations. And, and I, I know, Will, that you're, you're probably uh, aware of that as well. So the idea of somebody working for a corporation the rest of their life is just not, not there. One of the uh, social things that uh, uh, happens, I think, is that uh, uh, up until, and I'll try to pick a, a date, uh, maybe up until the uh, early 80s or mid 80s, uh, the, transfer, the shelf life, I'll go back to shelf life of technology, was such that uh, a person could work within that technology, within a corporation for his career. And uh, the, the rate of change of that technology within the corporation was such that emotionally, um, uh, uh, learning wise uh, and so forth, he was, or she was able to keep up with that. Now it's going so fast that I'm not sure that that happens. Um, 
whether you graduate from high school or from college, it's a well-known thing that uh, we can be out of date very quick unless there's uh, now uh, good support for re-education, new education on new technologies to keep us up to date. And also finally, I'll throw in the fact that the concept of, uh, of working as a contractor, an individual contractor has exploded in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and that again is sort of an offset to this uh, problem of or concept of working for a corporation and, re and retiring from them at the end of your, uh, your reasonable working period. So I've talked too much about this, but I think that, that's what affects uh, the way I think we should be looking at this, uh, at least since uh, the uh, the last uh, major recession. What do you think, Will? Well, I think um, that was a great a precursor to uh, me plugging my book, Atlas Shift, available on Amazon. Okay. I talk a lot about um, the shift away from uh, the, you know, cradle to grave, um, take the corporation taking care of you and, and your retirement and your health care. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of that came out of, uh, you know, the, the thought processes around uh, World War II and, and um, having, you know, young soldiers come back. And uh, I was actually kind of interested to find that, you know, one of the reasons that all guys um, in the professional sector wear a suit is because uh, that was the uniform of of the time period in which we decided that uniforms were important in the workplace. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm i kind of one of those people that likes to mix in a little bit of tradition with a little bit of innovation here. Um, I think that one of the 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 things that Grant brought up that I, I'm especially fascinated with is, um, you know, the, the shelf life of technology, but also I feel as if the public might be a little, um, you know, your general, your, you know, your average person might be a little uh, skeptical of, you know, the pace of technology. Um, and, and I think that there's a, you know, a, a very good question out there of what is actually shelf life of the technology and what is planned obsolescence? Because it seems like to me that there's just so many things that like, you know, I've got my phone here in front of me and it's like, okay, this is the iPhone eight. And so I'm two models out and all of a sudden it's, you know, the battery's not holding its charge and like we can put a man on Mars, but we can't make a battery last the work day. Like, we, you know what I mean? Like there's, there seems to be some sort of disconnect there on, um, you know, I know that you're making new technologies that are going to, to be better than the one that I currently have, but how much of that is planned so that you get to make a buck off of me upgrading to the new technology? Sure. And, and so, you know, I think that especially the technology world, um, but, you know, the, uh, the retail world in general has a lot of work to do to get the trust back, I think, of, of the public um, in, you know, in, and this is part of, you know, what I'm talking about, um, you know, writing in my next book is the, you know, the fact that we've just warped our uh, our relationship with wealth so badly over the past, you know, pretty much since the Industrial Revolution, pretty much since we decided that things can make us happy. I mean, what do we? Where do we go from this now? If all of a sudden, you know, this, the the you know, the underlying assumption that I can go and buy something and that's going to fix my issue. And now we have these, you know, really deep seated, you know, emotional, psychological issues that can't be solved by a new piece of technology or a new widget. Um, 
what do we do about that? Right. Yeah, I think I think one of the things were uh, that I tend to skirt around and didn't really answer directly. And, and uh, the people I think that uh, are the part of our society is going to suffer from this. And not even uh, you know excluding the pandemic for the moment, have been suffering from it. Uh, are the um, uh, the more labor intensive workers of the world? How do they solve? How do we solve? How does government solve? Help. Uh, with that problem, how do we? A person who has been uh, in a um, labor-intensive position or, or uh, activity for, let's say, until he was 55, all of a sudden, uh, it's automated and it's not no longer there, or it's offshore. How does how do we how do we handle that person? Uh, and even given the fact that he's no longer going to necessarily uh, live in a society that's, that has a, uh, a, an average lifespan of, let's say, 70 years old, now it's 85 or 90. Um, and what you do see, of course, in some cases, are people taking on new careers and, and new, new jobs. But there's still a core of our society that is a, suddenly becomes not so much an economic problem, but a social um, uh, political problem. And uh, uh, that is really, you know, a, a tough one to solve. We who are in the technology, the, in the leading edge technologies and such, uh, are, are not going to uh, experience the kind of suffering that uh, these people are experiencing. I think the COVID virus is, uh, exacerbating it for them, no doubt about it. And uh, they want to get back to work. Uh, and I am fully empathetic with the fact that uh, they are protesting against lockdowns. I can understand why they need to put uh, food on the table. Uh, but uh, even without the, the uh, pandemic, uh, that has opened up a, a uh, a uh, conversation that has been going on, but has um, suddenly made it much more uh, glaringly apparent. And I think uh, in coming out of this, even with a, a vaccine for the virus, um, there's gonna be some permanent damage in that sector of our society. And we need to know how to handle that from a social and economic and political standpoint. And that's where we're stumbling. Yeah, one of the things that raises, Will, is the role of government in crises like this. Um, we've obviously seen a lot of divisive and divided opinion about that. Um, what's your thought about that? From your perspective, uh, we, you know, from an economic perspective, what government has done or hasn't done, what's your thoughts on that? So I'm going to try and, and do this as succinctly as I can without, um, you know, getting, I think that one of the, the mistakes that we make today is looking at everything through a political lens. Not everything has to do with politics. Um, you know, a lot of these are social, uh, psychological, economical, um, you know, they're, they're, we just put so much focus around the political because I don't know, supposedly it sells ads or something, I don't know. But the, um, so what is particularly uh, of concern to me is the potential unintended consequences of the government's bailout programs, which you know, have become de rigueur of, you know, our era. And it seems um, that we are breeding more and more fair weather capitalists. What I mean by that is when things are good, we're capitalists. We love it. And when things are bad, we're socialists. Somebody help us. And so um this added that attitude is not without cost 
Um, so one of the costs that I believe is that if you're giving you know, so much power and control over to politicians, just like anybody else, they're going to be hesitant to give up the newfound power. Um, the, the federal government entered the year uh, spending about $1 trillion more than it received in taxes. So this was before COVID. Um, that deficit was equal to about 5% of overall GDP. Now, because of the self-imposed you know, economic shutdown and, and you know, all of the rest of the stuff that come with it, the, according to Forbes, the deficit has exploded by four, by a factor of four. So $4 trillion uh, or so, um, which is 20% of our overall um, economic activity. So the question then is, will the deficit explosion have a negative effect on economic st stability? And I would say, if the government lets it, right? No matter the, uh, you know, what, what's going on here, it seems as if the, you know, we just, we can't, we can't handle that little bit of pain that, um, you know, that, that seemingly the economic cycle wants to give us. And so as long as the money flows, then everything seems that, that everything's going to be okay. And so, um, you know, one of the things that this reminds me of is, uh, you know, I have my degree in economics. I'm a, you know, a student of the markets and kind of, you know, especially, you know, just economic theory in general. And, um, you know, this is the, the, you know, Keynesian view versus, you know, a little bit more capitalistic, um, you know, free market theory. And so, you know, Keynes, you know, believed that, um, you know, the government spending is the driver of economic life and, and, you know, the free market school, the name that come to mind, comes to mind is Friedman, um, you know, that believes that, or, or that school of thought believes that, um, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, that, that free market um, uh, controls or, or lack of controls are the thing that is going to bring about the most growth. And so, um, so I think today, you know, it, I think that, you know, Yes, there, we are in a different period since 2008, for sure. The world has changed a lot. Um, it has, has it changed so much that there's still no such thing as a free lunch? I mean, I, to, in my opinion, that's a pretty, you know, that's like one of those things that is just never going to change. And so as the federal government expands the spending programs and you know, we had the $2.3 billion CARE Act and a trillion, T, trillion with a T, and, um, you know, $25 billion bailout for airlines and, you know, cash infusions to small businesses and for renters and student loans. And um, so, so what is the cost of all of this going to be? Because it's not free. Um, so, and the question is, well, the government can can gin can can gin up money in in three one of three ways or usually th three different ways, but um, in today's world it seems to be leaning more towards one. So, one you can tax the private sector. Two you can borrow money from the private sector. Or three you can print money. We seem to be doing a lot of number three. And so, if um, I heard somebody say the other day. If you want to spend like Europe, get ready to pay taxes like Europe. And so um, I believe that, you know, who's going to pay for all of this? There's the who, what, why, where, when. Who's going to pay for all of this? If you are working and under 50, you are. That's, that's just the reality of it. In, um, you know, and, and that is a consequence, going back to, you know, how I opened this up, um, of our 
fair weather capitalist friends that you know if you want the government to come and bail everybody out then um you gotta be willing to pay for it yep and grant, <clears throat> grant, you have some some concerns about um the way the government has acted in terms of data uh so can you give us our view, your view on that one sure uh and and it ties a little bit into this um uh, you know i'm in a a profession that uh depends on data uh, we uh specialize in uh producing a certain kind of artificial intelligence that, that is used to predict things into the future and that just doesn't happen you have to have good data to do that and uh uh this might take the subject away from um what we've been talking about i hate to do that but uh, uh i think that uh, uh one of the the and it's been this pandemic and and the problems that have been created been created uh and and experienced by many people who are trying to understand this and make predictions of where we're going is the lack of data uh, and the data is definitely there it's just not centralized and uh, managed in a way that is easily accessible by the people in the world that have the technical ability and resources at their at their call to be able to take that data and do with it what they can which inevitably hopefully would be to uh, help us predict more about how the future is going to behave and so uh, in general i think that uh, it's been embarrassing for the united mm -hmm. states uh, even right today uh, our primary source our only source uh, of data to make predictions about where we're going with the pandemic and we're, we're producing uh, charts that go out uh, uh, 125 150 days into the future uh, the only source that we're uh, able to get data to process is from the private sector not from the government mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, obviously people in the private sector have spent money in big budgets to collect this information uh, and they're not just going to give it away uh, however and also of course uh, we have set of regulations at the state and federal level that uh, protect privacy that uh, where data becomes connected to individuals um, that data is not uh, by law and regulation not available but there's an in-between solution i believe and that is that the government needs to put together a major program uh, that would be uh, supported by the federal government where there is a national database available uh, and we can talk about just health as one sector to begin with uh, where uh, that information would be available to anyone either in the public or private sector uh, to take that data and process it uh, in a way to uh, certainly in the private sector profit off of it by making uh, good predictions better predictions about what's going on uh, in the future and that uh, uh, even in uh, the uh, uh, the new uh, uh, the 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 healthcare program, the federal healthcare program, that uh, has been established. Uh, you don't hear much uh, talk about any singular effort to centralize healthcare data for use by uh, people like ourselves, uh, who could uh, we think. Uh, produce some uh, reasonably good stuff, output, that could help uh, us understand uh, things like where is the virus going, uh, where are the deaths going, where are the new cases going, and all of the other things that have to do with predicting um, health issues into the future. Uh, as far as I know, there's been no singular conversation uh, connected with the Affordable Care, Care Act uh, that uh, has been devoted to the creation of such a database. And that's, that's a crime. The data is there. Uh, the federal government needs to take responsibility for 
uh, putting that, uh, that initiative out there and developing the infrastructure to create it. Okay. The subject where we were, but uh, that's my, <laughs> my uh, platform for the day. Well, we were talking about uh, the different government roles, yeah. uh, either in the economic sector or the health sector. And I think you've both been um, outright and, and forthright in what you mm -hmm. said about that. Okay, so as we kind of come towards the end here, um, Will, what's your final thought here? How do you see this unfolding the best way you can or any other final comments that you have? Sure, so I, um, you know, I don't think, you know, that we're going to, to fall in, into a depression. That's about as probably optimistic as I can get for you. Um, but, but the, uh, you know, the environment that we're experiencing is, and I think this is, we should just, let's just kind of, you know, kind of, uh, reassert all of this, which is that, you know, this is different. Um, the driver, behind all of this is an internal imbalance, right? It's not the bubbles like we, we talked about in the beginning here. And I, I think that, um, you know, over the next month or so, um, or, you know, few months, we're going to start to see what the, you know, the fallout, the, the aftermath of uh, the economic contraction and the uh, all the stimulus uh, will be. Um, the, I think that the Fed, um, you know, lowering interest rates and flooding the banking system with liquidity. Um, you know, when my question in, to you know, kind of leave everybody hanging here is when. Is that going to be the new headline on the newspaper as far as the new crisis? Because I think that day is coming. Um, you, know, you can't. I mean, I, I just I think that there, the, the the balance sheet has just gotten too big. And, um, but you know there. I mean, there are other possible outcomes. Um, you know, corporate. Well, let's see what happens with with corporate profits and unemployment and, um, you know, death rate and, and all of the other stuff. But um, I think that uh, that said, you know, while I'm, I'm bearish on this crisis, I'm not very optimistic about, on this crisis. Um, I'm bullish on our country. I think that uh, we are still a, a powerful force for good. Um, and the virus isn't going to change that. Um, and, and I say, uh, better, day lie, better days lie ahead. Okay, well, that's, that's optimistic. Uh, Grant, what about you? Well, uh, uh, two things. One is I would, uh, I would make the statement that uh, we need to, in the process of uh, the dialogues that are going on all over the country and the world, attempt to separate the effects of the pandemic, the economic effects of the, of the pandemic on the basic underlying economies, especially in the US. Uh, uh, I think that uh, connecting it in sort of a series, uh, one of the things that happens in an economy as it goes forward might mislead us as to how we think the recovery will occur. I think the recovery from the pandemic, the economic recovery will be probably faster than what I think we that we uh, that we're that we're discussing. So that's that's the first issue. The second is that uh, um, uh, separating out the effects of the pandemic from the economy, uh, the idea of uh, an exponential growth of uh, technology, and as Ray Kurzweil would call it. Uh, a, an exponential of the exponential growth to try to keep up with what's going on um, uh, is uh, something that is a separate issue. Uh, it is creating 
a uh, section of our society that uh, needs to uh, uh, be heard and understood. Uh, the effect of what's happening there is a political one, uh, regardless of which side you're on. And uh, that's the way people who are frustrated and out of work or um, suffering from uh, what's going on generally in the economy are expressing themselves. And uh, we've got to listen to that. And um, uh, both at the local, state, and federal level, do what we can uh, to, uh, uh, to help solve those problems. But uh, I totally agree with uh, Will. I am super optimistic about this country, especially since, since 2008, how we've come out of it. Uh, uh, that is uh, just uh, historic of course, uh, never been done before. And I don't think there's anything that's going to stop it in the meantime, other than this quick recovery from the pandemic. Great. Well, good optimistic notes to end on. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, Will is the financial planner. He's the founding principal of Prosper Point, wealth management company in LA. Uh, you certainly might want to check out his book, Atlas Shift, uh, about mastering your financial experience in uh, post-information age. And uh, I know Will's working on another book too, so we'll, we'll have him back when we're ready to produce that. And of course, Grant, thank you too for being with us and for doing this second part in our series about opening up the economy. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen.